everybody. Welcome to WordPress Montclair 2022. This is our first session in track two. Right. Today we have Nikki Keen presenting what is hybrid agile and why it's helpful in larger organizations. Before we start, just please turn your cell phones off or at least on vibrate so you are super friendly to our speaker. We will have about a 30 minute session, maybe a little bit less. So if you have questions, we would love for you to ask your questions at the end. And even after that, if you have a question that you don't feel comfortable asking in front of other people, we have a little happiness lounge right outside. So you can find Nikki there after the session, or at any point you can find Nikki anywhere. I also <laughs> want to remind everyone we have an after party. There are signs everywhere. Please take a picture of it so you remember where it is when you leave here. And without further ado, Nikki, what is yours? Thank you. Thank you. All right, I am very excited to be here. I'm excited to uh, be in person with you all. I'm excited to be at WordCamp, and I'm really excited to talk about hybrid agile, which might sound like a very strange thing to say, but it's something I'm very passionate about. So, let's kick off. Okay, so what I'm going to go over today, and there is going to be a little bit of me talking at you for probably about 20 minutes or so, but. Uh, as we mentioned, questions, I'm always open to questions now or later. Um, it's something that, uh, you know, hybrid agile is something that I've been working with across my career for about 15 years. It's something that I think there's a lot of misconception about. Um, and it's something that I'm very excited to explain in a little bit more detail about what it is, what it isn't, talk through some use cases. And I'm also going to talk a little bit about how we utilize hybrid agile at Penske Media at PMC. So. To introduce myself, uh, so I'm Nikki Catton. Um, I am the VP of Product Delivery at Penske Media. Uh, Penske Media is a, a large media company. Uh, we've got about 32 brands, um, and I oversee project and product management at Penske Media. I work in a team, we call ourselves PEP, uh, which stands for Product Engineering and Project. We do have some hot sauce outside as well, if anybody wants to help yourself to some hot sauce, as we call ourselves the peppers of PMC. Uh, so, you know, part of my role is really focusing on running a very large portfolio of work. As I mentioned, we're servicing probably about 32 brands. We also have corporate stakeholders that are requesting things from our team all the time. You know, it's not just brands, there's legal, there's revenue operations, there's SEO, there's business development. And so we're really, you know, managing a matrix of work. I always say our team has about 4,000 things coming in at any given time for about 300 people. Um, and so part of what I work hard to do at the, at the company is to make sure we've got the right processes in place to be able to handle that. Uh, I started my career as an Agile consultant. Agile is, runs in my blood. Um, and I'm very, very passionate about process. So if anybody has any questions about stuff that isn't hybrid Agile, just general process, please, please grab me at any point. I'd love to discuss more. Uh, and one final thing, I'm probably the most accident-prone person you'll ever meet. So if anybody wants to hear about how I fell down Kilimanjaro or fell in a swamp in Thailand, also great coffee stories, I'm highly concerned about this massive wire that I'm probably going to trip over at some point in this presentation. <laughs> so if that happens, we'll just, we'll just block that out. We'll edit that out of the video. Okay, so I want to start by saying that this can be a very polarizing topic. Uh, hybrid agile, um, or the concept of, you know, kind of mixing agile with other methodologies is something that people get very, very passionate about. So what I'm going to talk about today is based on my experience and, you know, my opinion. Um, you know, but it is something that is, uh, you know, that what I'm going to kind of dig into is backed up by others. This isn't just me making this up. There are a lot of other people that are exploring hybrid agile. Um, you know, a lot of people have experienced and tried different things as well. And I, I came across this quote the other day, and I just, I really like it. I thought it kind of sums up the discussion and debate about agile and agile methodologies and other methodologies very well. Um, and I definitely consider myself in the pragmatist camp, um, as you'll see as I go through this. Okay, so I want to play a little game. So who here has heard a quote, any of these quotes, or, you know, experience, heard, you know, even said it yourself, any of the quotes on this, uh, on this table or something similar to these? Cool. A couple of people. A few more. Yeah. <laughs> so who here could basically win Agile Bingo by probably crossing out a line, hearing all three? Yeah. 
yeah, so, uh, you know, this is something, our child is, is you know, there's, there's a reason so many people talk about it, right? There's a reason so many people write blogs about it. There's a reason so many people make money off it, frankly, because there are lots of schools of thoughts about how, you know, how the, the best way you should implement Agile, what Agile is, what it isn't, all those kind of bits and pieces. So, you know, I, I, this might seem like I'm kind of really being negative about Agile, and I'm not. I think Agile has been hugely transformative for software development um, and for delivery processes in general. I think the Agile Manifesto is, is one of the most powerful things that has come out of the industry in the last 20 years or so, or probably more than that now, just over 20 years. Um, but I think, you know, it is, it is a, uh, it can be often, you know, kind of perceived or portrayed as the savior of software development. And I think there's a, there's some truth in that. Um, uh, but I think the, the negative connotations of other methodologies, such as, uh, I'm going to say the W word, so please don't, don't, you know, don't throw things at me, such as Waterfall, such as Prince2, such as other plan driven methodologies, they can be almost automatically written off, I think, by a lot of teams and a lot of companies. And I think that perception can, you know, I think, I think it can cause people to not necessarily um, explore, you know, kind of different ways of managing projects or different ways of managing delivery. And the thing that I always say, and anyone that's worked with me or kind of come in contact with me over the last few years, you know, the for me, the clue is in the name with Agile. The point of Agile is that it's a way of thinking. It's a manifesto. It is not about hard and fast rules. And so I personally think you should be Agile with Agile. And I think remembering you know, why it's called Agile is, uh, you know, is something that can be very important. OK, so what is hybrid Agile? So this is the uh, very basic definition um, by Agile Alliance. Um, so essentially, you know, hybrid Agile is basically combining Agile methodologies with anything else that's not Agile. So you know, they could, that can be um, Waterfall, it could be Prince2, it could be other plan-driven methodologies. You know, a, a lot of people actually call it hybrid delivery approach or um, hybrid development approach, which you know, is probably a little bit more of an accurate name, to be honest, than, than hybrid agile. Um, but the, you know, the, the concept is, is that if we map our, you know, if we map the, the, the degree of change and the frequency of delivery onto a graph and kind of separate it out into quadrants, you know, in the high degree of change and the high frequency of delivery quadrant, we've got agile. You know, you are constantly trying things, pushing things out, pushing out shippable products, seeing what works, changing things. You're able to adapt. You're able to be agile. Uh, you know, and in the, in, the, in the bottom left quadrant down here, this is where we've got more plan-driven delivery. So these are things that are, you know, kind of set, set in stone, for want of a better phrase, what you're delivering, when you're delivering it. You're probably not going to be delivering very frequently. There are sometimes multi-year projects that kind of use this methodology. And essentially, hybrid's just in the middle. So, you know, it's basically anywhere, and, it, and you know, it really can vary as well. You know, you can be right in the middle, or you might be a little bit more down in the plan driven, or you might be a little bit more in the agile quadrant. And one of the things I'm gonna talk about, about how we do things at PMC, is that even within one team or within co one company, you don't have to stay stagnant within that hybrid cloud. You can move around, up, down, diagonally, wherever you want to go, dependent on your team needs, your project needs, your company needs at that given time. And I really like this graph because actually I only came across this graph a couple of years ago and it really cemented my experience from working in large organizations like the BBC or like Penske Media for the past 15 years. It really, it kind of, it was something that finally visually represented what I've been trying to explain for a long time, basically. Okay, so what isn't hybrid agile? Uh, this is a great quote by Jason Gorman. Wagile is the pinnacle of dysfunctional development methodologies, um, which is uh, a quite an aggressive quote. Uh, but I would say, you know, it's, it's, it's great news because hybrid agile does not equal Wagile. So there is this misconception that only waterfall and agile, which is where we get the name Wagile, uh, are the only two methodologies in existence. And you pick one or you pick the other. They're polar opposites. They're mutually exclusive. You, you are either Team Agile or Team Waterfall. And that is not true. You know, firstly, they're both very widely used broad terms. You know, when we talk about Agile, people instinctively think of Scrum. But Agile is a, frame, is a, you know, a framework of multiple methodologies. Scrum, Kanban, Scrumban. 
XP, all the things in, in between. Um, and you know, same with waterfall. You know, people assume that waterfall is the only plan-driven methodology out there. And actually, there are a lot of methodologies out there that don't require, you know, three months of upfront requirements gathering, three months of getting all the designs locked in, three months of talking before you actually deliver anything. Um, so even within those terminologies, even just saying agile and waterfall, people are using those in, in the wrong way. They're not, as, uh, they're not as rigid as people are basically uh, talking about them. And this is a, a graph by uh, uh, someone called Chuck Cobb. Um, he's done a lot of research and a lot of thinking and a lot of uh, thought leadership on magic, basically managed agile. Um, so within the kind of, you know, the two circles of a, a plan-driven approach and an adaptive approach, waterfall and agile, you know, they're, they're, they're at the more extreme ends, but you've got this entire section in the middle where you can basically, I don't know, start doing some hybrid uh, management there. And uh, another thing that Chuck Cobb uh, came up with, which I liked as well, he, ca he talks about this concept of cooks versus chefs when it comes to delivery. And, you know, essentially a cook, you know, for, and this is very simplistic terms, if anyone works in the uh, catering industry, then apologies. But, you know, a cook essentially is following a recipe. They are following steps. They are doing A, B, C, D. They are following rules. And they're delivering great food. You know, it tastes delicious. It's, ve it's very well thought out. Um, it's something that, you know, is going to be consistent, which is, you know, always, always great. But a chef is actually taking elements, right? So it's taking base ingredients, they're taking flavor profiles, they're combining things, they're coming up with new things, they're experimenting, they're seeing what works and seeing what doesn't work and coming up with unique and innovative meals. And you know, when we think about kind of following process and setting process, I think one of the key things about hybrid agile is that you need someone that actually is more of a chef. You need someone that understands the different elements of various different methodologies and can figure out what, will, what elements will complement each other and what elements could be contradictory to each other and work with that to come up with a methodology or a process or approach that actually works for the team, actually works for the, you know, the diners, the cuisine, the restaurant, the budget on that given day. Okay. So, I want to just mention quickly about blended agile um, because these two terms can be mixed up quite a lot, hybrid and blended. And again, there's actually very differing schools of thoughts on this. Some people actually think the opposite. But, you know, a general consensus is that whereas hybrid is mixing agile methodologies and agile approaches with other non-agile methodologies, blended agile is actually blending elements of different agile methodologies together. So Scrum Ban is a great example of that. Um, you know, you might be working in, your teams might be working in Scrum, you might be running sprints, uh, you might be using all the Scrum ceremonies, but you also might be taking some elements of Kanban. So you might be adding some limits to how many tickets you can have in a specific status at any given time. Work in progress limits are a, a foundation of Kanban. Some people like to take some elements of Kanban and mix it with Scrum, um, which basically just uh, allows you to get a little bit more uh, control over um, the work in progress, essentially. And so that's an example of taking two elements from Agile methodologies and blending them together, which is actually blended Agile. So let's talk about some use cases, and then I'm going to dig into a case study about PMC. So there are a number of different use cases where hybrid Agile can be helpful. Um, one of the most common ones is when you're starting to introduce Agile into a workplace or into a, an organization that's never worked with Agile before. Going straight into the full Agile approach can be terrifying, you can be blocked, you can be shut down, people are just not open to it. So starting to do a hybrid Agile approach, so maybe starting to introduce some of the elements of Agile into the daily working, um, but you know, maybe having still having a little bit more project governance or gates or steps or change management can be helpful to start to get your executives or your company on board. It's a stepping stone, essentially. Managing a hybrid agile can be very useful for managing a portfolio of work where you've got complexity um, or you've got different projects that are dependent on each other, you've got programs, uh, you've got you know, uh, limited resources but uh, very clear deliverables for a year and that's kind of the case study I'm going to talk about with PMC. Um, hybrid, uh, agile can be, can be much easier to implement when you are working with one stakeholder group. 
right? So if you are trying to make one set of stakeholders or clients, whatever it is, understand why Agile is beneficial, why it's going to actually benefit in the long run, that can be much easier when you're just dealing with a couple of people. When you are dealing with multiple gr stakeholder groups who don't talk to each other, they don't like each other half the time, you know, trying to get them to understand the benefits of Agile um, all at once, you know, kind of like take that full leap, it can be impossible and terrifying and frankly exhausting as well. So when you are working with lots of different stakeholder groups who are complex or they're difficult or you know, they, they, they're just not interested in, in, in com coming on the journey of, of agile adoption with you, that's where, again, hybrid agile can help. It's, it's a softer approach, it's a stepping stone. And then frankly, and this is the most common one I've seen, uh, being able to tell an executive what they're going to get and when. Uh, that's, so for, to be able to do that, you're probably going to need to start mixing in some other elements of methodologies into your Agile. You know, I've said it my, myself, you know, I've gone to executives and said, well, we're working in an Agile fashion, which means that we'll be able to give some more information as we work through you know, our sprints. We'll be able to demo to you every couple of weeks. You'll be able to change your mind. And the number one thing they always come back with is, yeah, great, when am I going to get my product launched? And I can't answer it. <laughs> so, <laughs> so let's talk a little bit more about what we do at Penske Media, at PMC. So to set the tone of some of the challenges we face there, um, you know, as I mentioned earlier, we've got a portfolio of work. We have a lot of brands uh, that we are working with. They themselves have a huge variety in the types of requests that are coming in to us. So sometimes they can be a tiny bug fix. Sometimes it can be a massive program of work. It can be a huge infrastructure upgrade for them. Um, they themselves, within their own brands, have competing priorities as well. So editorial wants something, sales wants something, marketing wants something, events want something. And a lot of our bigger projects in particular are also directly linked to re you know, direct revenue, revenue generating work. Um, or it could be something that is very, very strategically important for the brand and how they're positioning themselves in the industry. And also, frankly, Penske Media, we buy a, at least one company a year. So, <laughs> you know, even if, even if we get our best, you know, we get everything kind of locked in and everything's working well, change comes to us very frequently. And so we have to be able to adapt to change on a micro level, but also on a, on a, on a very, very large scale as well. The other thing that's interesting about Penske Media, and you know, this, is, uh, this can be very common in, in publishing brands and in uh, enterprise companies, a lot of our um, brands sit in verticals that have industry event cycles. So if we, for example, if we want to do a major upgrade on an entertainment website, we cannot do major changes to the websites between May and September because that is the Emmys campaigning season. We make a lot of money. So we break a website during that time. I'm not even going going back into work the next day. I'm just going to leave the country. But I'm going back to the UK at that point. Um, you know. Also, uh, not only not only is it the risk of you know the quality or any kind of issues that come up, but a lot of the clients that have bought ads on our websites have bought very specific slots. They bought it based on what the website is on the day they bought that campaign, right? So suddenly, if when their campaign runs, the ad is in a different position, or it's a slightly different format, or they need to provide different creatives, it just causes chaos. We have that in the summer with entertainment brands. We have the same between November and February, because that's the film awards season, so we can't do major changes on their sites then. We've got fashion brands who have fashion week, September, October, February. We've got a number of music brands now, and there are music awards year long, but there are some major ones that we have to avoid. So we, can't, we have to be able to manage very, very carefully and communicate and commit to when we are going to do major changes to websites. We, can't, we don't have the luxury of, of, you know, basically we don't have the luxury of missing those dates. Because if we miss those dates, sometimes we've got to wait six months to be able to do something again. Um, and then finally, uh, you know, and again, this is, this is a common one, but business planning requires project commitment. You know, we are sometimes working on projects or product upgrades that actually are directly related to uh, strategy from a brand, or we know is actually going to bring in direct revenue. And those businesses need to be able to plan their projections based on what we're going to deliver and when. So again, turning around and kind of going, yeah, yeah, maybe Q3, Q4, doesn't really get well received at, at PMC. So how do we do this? So I started to plot out uh, some of the work that we do uh, at, at PMC in, in the product and engineering team. 
And as I mentioned earlier, we've got a vast scale of work. We've got quick things, we've got single tickets, you know, one point tickets, three point tickets, five point tickets. And then we have multi-year, multi-million dollar projects. Um, and when I started to kind of like map out the scale of how we approach these things, I kind of realized that we, we almost work directly on this diagonal line from, from the plan driven through the hybrid up to the agile. So if I start in the, in the agile quadrant in the top right, so our small features, bugs, improvements, ongoing product development, all those bits and pieces, they are definitely managed in a more pure agile fashion. So we have small cross-functional teams, we call them pods. They work in either Scrum or Kanban. They don't have project management. They've got a product owner and they've got a Scrum master. Uh, they've got a tech lead, uh, you know, who's handling tech advice, architectural guidance, all those kind of bits and pieces. But this is changeable work. You know, we work directly with our stakeholders, uh, the corporate or the brands, to go through their priority list, to go through their backlogs. And they can change, you know, so for some of our teams that use Kanban, those priorities are changing every few days. You know, a lot of them are, are revenue generating or, you know, kind of uh, revenue generating ideas. They want to try things, they want to throw things out, they want to experiment, they want to pilot on a couple of brands. Um, you know, some of the, some of the uh, features that are coming in from our, uh, from our actual brands are just single brand focused. You know, it's just something we're going to do on one website. When we start going down and we start kind of working on bigger things, so we have this kind of what we call medium projects. Um, these kind of fall into two camps. They're either like a one and done in the sense that it might be something that sales has sold. They've sold a microsite. We need to build it. We don't need to do much product definition because frankly sales have done it. Uh, we don't need to maintain it crucially. So we're gonna launch it. They're gonna make some money off it. Then in a year's time, we're gonna shut down that microsite. You know, or we ourselves want to do some very defined product evolution. We want to take some, you know, one of our features, we want to take our gallery template, for example, and we want to work on things slowly in the background as a product and engineering teams, try some things and, you know, kind of uh, and work to improve, you know, run some experiments, see what works, roll it out to the other brands. These are the kind of things where we don't need a huge amount of kind of project oversight. We, you know, we, we don't, we need to meet a date or we need to meet a goal. We don't necessarily need to do both at the same time. So we need a little bit more project definition and a little bit more uh, process around it, but still not extreme. And as we get down towards this kind of quadrant, our large projects, and these are roadmapped. So at the end of every year, we sit down with our exec team and we say, we work through what we're gonna work on our large projects for the next year. And then we go away and figure out if we can actually deliver them and also how much resource we need to do it. These are big projects that exec care about. These are things where, you know, that sometimes it's a replatform when we have an acquisition, we wanna get them onto our technology or a brand wants a major redesign and we can't launch between May and September or November and February. So these are things that, as well as kind of making sure that you know, we are, we're developing in the, in the best way and using the best quality, we also are accountable and answerable to executives for these kind of projects. They want to know what's going on. They want to know what the risks are. They want to know if we're going to meet those dates. They want to help. You know, if things are going off track, they want to be able to help us course correct. So these are things that you know, we definitely need a little bit more project governance over it. We put project managers on these projects. So we have, we actually have defined project management function. They work on things like reporting. They work on things like stakeholder analysis. They work on things like risk and decision logs. Now I'll give some couple of examples in a second as well. And then finally, as we get down to this corner, these projects are huge investment projects, right? They are often things that the business is investing a significant amount of money in. They are multi-year, they are transformative, they are gonna you know, completely change the way some of our businesses work. So these generally you know, are a little bit more set in stone. We don't have as much change that kind of comes into those. I mean, obviously we uncover things as you go, always. But then we're not expected to be, you know, knocking things out. We're not expected to be um, delivering frequently with those. We, the, the business knows it's going to take a long time. But because of the investment that's going into those, we're even more accountable. You know, we're even more on the, on the hook to make sure that they know what's going on and where their money is going, frankly. So what we kind of do for these... Uh, large and kind of business transformation projects is this is how we handle our hybrid agile approach and i'll go through the project governance layer in a second 
But essentially, you know, we kick off a project and actually our kickoff time is the most important time on any project for us. That is when we're going through and we're doing a definition. You know, what, what are the goals of this project? The amount of projects that I've seen that have run and they've hit a speed bump, they've come through across some trouble, and the, the team themselves can't figure out the best path forward because everyone's got a different opinion on what the project's actually trying to achieve. So it's a really simple foundational thing that a lot of people forget to do. If you at the start of a project sit down and say, okay, what are the actual goals that we are trying to achieve here? You know, three to five goals is always a, a good number. Make sure the team's in agreement and then take it to your stakeholders or your investors or whoever it is, your client, and make sure they are in agreement of what you're trying to achieve. When it comes down to difficult decisions, these are going to be the things that are going to help you make those decisions. From that, you know, kind of what's your top level scope? What, crucially, what's not in scope, I think is always super important to get that definition out at the start, an agreement from the start. Um, especially if you are looking at something that does have a tighter timeline or a little bit more of a firm deadline. Uh, stakeholder analysis, again, like, who, you know, who's the decision maker? Who's in the room? Who needs to be informed? Uh, you know, who, you know, doesn't really care but just what kind of wants to be escalated to for one area? So doing some more, fake, uh, more formal stakeholder analysis can be, re again, really just set up the project for success. Uh, some other foundational things like what's our technical approach? What's our project approach? Do we need to multi-phase? Like, do we have one major deliverable? Are we going to do delivery throughout the project? What are our major milestones? And related to that, you know, some, some very top level planning. So I am a firm believer that you can combine sprint planning and Gantt charts, which a lot of people don't think you can do. And I'm going to show you an example in a second. But kind of go, going through some top level planning, taking your scope, taking your backlogs, and figuring out, okay, roughly what does this look like? You know, knowing that you're going to uncover things, knowing that things are going to come up and they might adjust. But at the very least, having your, your top level milestones, particularly if you need to be doing things like training people, you know, giving them a heads up of when they're going to need to be involved. When do they need to review something? When do they need to decide something? So we do a lot of we do a lot of upfront planning and definition. What we don't do is we do not write every single ticket at the start of a project. We do not sit down and write all our Jira tickets or come up with all of our product requirements or do formal product requirements documents. So throughout delivery, we are still following the process of just-in-time requirements. We are, we are, our team is great at just-in-time everything. And, you know, we're still, normally we run our projects in sprints. We still have the sprint planning. We are still doing grooming sessions. We are still uh, doing demos throughout as well. So the actual delivery of the work is still handled in an agile format. But then what we do over the top of it is just add some more artifacts, like a, I call it a tool belt of, of things that can help with communication, and honestly, I always think that if project management is doing their job correctly, they are keeping the stakeholders, the execs, everyone off the back of the team so the team can just run with the sprints, they can run with development, they can run with figuring out what we're doing and how we're gonna do it. So, as I kind of mentioned this a little bit, but a couple of tools that we use at PMC, um, and I'll show you some screenshots in a second. So, we use uh, a racy matrix, uh, anyone that's in my, in my team is probably laughing because it's my favorite thing to bring up in the world. Uh, but we use a stakeholder analysis matrix to identify who's responsible, who's accountable, who should be consulted, and who should be informed across different areas of, of the project. It's really, really helpful, again, when you've got those tough decisions. If you've got one person that's very clearly defined as your decision maker in a specific area and they know it, then ultimately they're going to be the person who makes that decision. You can have other people that want to be in the conversation, but if they are very clearly defined as being consulted, you know, you're setting that expectation with them up front that their opinion is valuable, but they're not going to always win, essentially. Uh, we use decision and risk logs as well. So, you know, there are a gazillion decisions being made across any kind of delivery. Um, and when you are in the minutiae of that detail, it's very easy to forget what was decided by when, uh, by who and when. And also what still needs to be decided. You know, sometimes you recognize someone needs to make a decision. It doesn't need to happen right now. The team needs to focus on something else. So throwing it in a log and saying someone needs to make this decision at some point in July, you know, is a great way of making sure that doesn't fall through the gaps. Risk logs, just to make sure that, you know, we are identifying potential risks, uh, that we are sitting down and coming up with some mitigation and contingencies for them as well, trying to avoid it happening, what do we do when it happens. 
again, just adding a little bit more formality around, um, you know, capturing things that could go wrong. Uh, I mentioned already a Gantt chart, um, so you know, having come up with a top level plan uh, using, using the sprint format to help answer the question when, but also, as I said, set expectations of what you need from people and when you actually need that. And then finally, you know, even though we're doing uh, sprint demos to you know, kind of actually show off what we're developing throughout the project, when you have a large stakeholder group, you're probably not going to get like 30% of those people to a demo. Like that's just the nature of, you know, they have day jobs. They're pretty busy. Um, so having a formal weekly report just to send out status updates, risks, you know, let them know what we're concerned about, what decisions need to be made, what decisions were made. It's a great way of just making sure that people are getting that information pushed to them as well. So, I'm almost done, so I'm just going to flash up a couple of screenshots and I'd be happy to talk through these in more detail. Obviously, this is impossible to read, but essentially, this is, this was, this is a real-life project plan. It's a Gantt chart from uh, a redesign project, a re-platform project that we did last year. So, I've expanded out a couple of sprints here, but essentially, what you can see is, you know, we, we basically take our, our, project, our project backlog, and we start just kind of bucketing up the deliverables into sprints. We say roughly, you know, we've got a, rough, we've got a pretty good idea of our team velocity. Um, and if we don't, we'll normally do this after a sprint or two to, so we can figure out what the capacity actually is. But, you know, roughly, okay, sprint one, we can, we can, we can get the header done. We can get the newswire module done. We can get the footer done. Okay, that's kind of a bucket one for sprint one. Going down and planning out the rest of the sprints that way, and obviously you adjust, right? You're gonna work through your actual sprint planning. You're gonna be able to do more or less than what you think or you thought at the start. And so you can constantly update and adjust the plan. But in doing that as well, you know, you are very then very, very visually able to see if after sprint three, you know, you've had, you've still got items in sprint one that are in progress, then you're probably at risk of your overall timeline. So what do you need to do? Is that something that the date needs to push out? Great, start communicating it. Do you need more resources? Great, start asking for it. You know, that's what, that's a very, it's a very, it's a much easier way to basically track and get ahead of things pushing out on a, on a sprint by sprint basis. Here's an example of a decision log. Again, it's from the same project from a uh, redesign re-platform that we did. So, uh, you know, basically it's a, we use Confluence here, but you can use a spreadsheet, a very simple spreadsheet. You know, what needs to be decided? What's the status of it? Who's involved? What was the outcome? When was it decided? And who was the ultimate decision maker? So just a way of tracking the, you know, it's like, do we merge GA accounts? Do we allow commenting? Things like that that, you know, are constantly going on throughout the project. And it's very, very easy to forget, you know, who decided and when. This is an example of a racy matrix. And I actually, this was a small project for us. This was a small re-platform. But you can see how many people are on this, on this matrix. These are all the people that need to be involved in this project in some way. So, you know, there's, there's a lot of repetition of names across here, but I mean, this consulted column, you can see how big that is. And so in doing this upfront analysis, again, it's basically making sure that that accountable column, that that is very clear, you've got one name in there, they're your decision makers. And doing this analysis upfront, you know, A does two things, like I said, it sets the uh, tone, the expectation of, um, of who actually, what level of involvement people have. But also, this is great for just for knowing who you need to send communications out to. You know, when you're sending out a weekly report, make sure everyone on this is on that list. It's a great way of just capturing, uh, you know, who you're dealing with, basically. And then finally, just an example of a weekly report that we send out. So we use the same format for all of our projects. So uh, corporate stakeholders, corporate uh, executives get very used to the format. Uh, it basically just highlights the, you know, the overall summary, the status, what the goals are. Always, we always put that top and front to remind people what we're actually trying to do here. Um, especially if you do have you know, new stakeholders that crop up throughout the project who have a very differing opinion on what we're doing. Major milestones, risks and issues for attention, 
and then decisions made or due. So it's just a, a very simple format, lots of color, try and get people's attention, try and get people to read things, you know. Um, but also it's just a, a great way of, honestly, it's, it's protecting ourselves as well. You know, if we send this out on a weekly basis and someone turns around in four months and says, I don't know what's going on with this project, we can basically say, well, I mean, if you read your email, you, you kind of would. So, it, you know, it's, it's a way of uh, covering our backs, essentially. But it is very, very useful. Um, and it is a great way to also just call things out. You know, if we send this down in an email and in the email body, we'll often be like, hey, executive number one, we need a decision by you tomorrow. What do you need to get there, essentially? So, you'll be pleased to hear that's the end of me talking now after <laughs> 33 minutes. That went longer than I thought. So, any questions? <laughs> I'm open to them now. Or, yeah. Uh, yeah, I have a question. You said you don't write, the, uh, you don't write all the Jira tickets at the beginning, yeah. which sounds freeing. <laughs> <laughs> so, when it's do you quite do it? So, when do you do it? Like, you do it, I'm assuming you do it before the beginning of each sprint. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So, yeah, basically, just before the sprint. So, as we kind of get into before sprint planning, we do grooming, yeah, you know. Planning. Yeah. And so, we, we basically get those tickets lined up ready for the planning right. session. So, this sprint has its own goal of yeah. doing whatever. Exactly, exactly. Tickets. And so for that, do you have, like, um, you said you, like, limit the amount of tickets that you can do? Is that based on, like, I know, like, some people do, like, what is it, like, like Jira Poker or something, right? Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah. So, so actually, on our projects, we don't really put work in progress limits on. Um, we do keep an eye on our velocity so that we can like generally get a good sense of how many points we commit to. Okay. And then in the planning session, we use planning poker. So the engineers themselves are all, you know, it's, uh, say, they're putting their estimates in and then working together to figure out what the actual estimate on the ticket should be, what the story points should be. Okay. So it's like so. I think this task is going to take five points. And yeah. Yeah, we try not to equate points okay. to the time because okay. I think that's a slippery slope. Um, but it's more like once they get through the planning, you know, if they know that you know the last two sprints they've done 25 points roughly, mm -hmm. and they get through the planning and they basically say, oh my god, we've got 40 points lined up for this sprint, mm -hmm. then that's when you're going to start, you know, cutting off the bottom of your sprint backlog. You know, the lowest priority items, basically. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah, of course. Yes. Do you, guys, sorry, do, you guys have, do you guys have like a, a sizing or grooming session? Like the, so you write the tickets and then how do you, at which ceremony do you do your, um, your voting? Your voting your so yeah, so we do the, the, the estimating and our planning. Huh? So in, the, in, the, in the sprint planning session is where so we do, do the estimating. We have separate grooming as well. So we'll do grooming first to basically come up with the sprint candidates. And that's also making sure. So in the grooming session, it's generally the project manager, the product manager, and the tech lead. So making sure that those tickets are you know, actually you know, ready to be developed further. Do we, you know, are we waiting on designs before we even start thinking about writing requirements? Or at least coming up, you know, using the, the overall Gantt chart as well to come up with the sprint candidates, basically. Make sure that the leads are in agreement of what the ticket's actually trying to achieve then flesh that out with the requirements, take it into the planning session, and then that's where the estimation and commitment happens. How much of that is actually done with the team? Because like, by the time you get to your planning session, you yeah. probably want to have at least, you might not have tickets written out, but tasks. Yeah, so by the time we get to planning, we actually tr we try and have our tickets written out. We try and have the re full requirements in the ticket so that the, the, so that the team can estimate as accurately as they can. And, you know, sometimes there's not full requirements there. We try and make sure they don't go into a sprint. Sometimes we know that we're waiting on, like, one piece of information that's coming tomorrow, so we'll put it in. And then if that information is not received, then that thing comes out of the sprint. So, yeah. I was wondering if you could talk about managing people or pushback. There's a yeah. couple of kinds I've had in similar situations where folks are either like, why aren't we planning? And they're like, no, this is the stage where we don't plan. This is where we move. And like, why aren't we yeah. shipping? They're like, this is the stage where we plan. Um, and then also in general, because I've been doing, it's not agile, but other hybrid approaches, yeah. I get a little bit of pushback of like, why do you think you're so smart if you know it better than like the experts? Why don't you yeah. sticking to a plan instead of trying <laughs> to like make it work for us? So I don't know if there's tools to manage those kinds Yeah, of I mean, are you talking about mainly like kind of stakeholders or clients you're getting pushback from or the team Either or both? Team, the team, okay. Too, yeah. yeah, so definitely experienced a lot of pushback in my life from multiple areas. I mean, I would say on like the, the stakeholder side or you know your client side, 
it's, it's upfront, right? So one of the key things that we do, we, we kick off a project with a formal kickoff presentation. And we talk through how we work. We talk through what they, what they can expect from us. We talk through things like, you can expect regular updates. We'll have a bi-weekly meeting where you can come along and ask questions. But we also talk through you know, the concept of that we, 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 we do work on things iterative, iteratively. And you know, we are going to be developing things in the background. And things are going to come up, and we're going to uncover things, and we're going to need you to make decisions or change, you know, work with us to change the scope or whatever it is. So I think having the conversation very upfront with your stakeholder and clients about how you work and what you can expect, what they can expect from you and what you need from them is really, really helpful. On the team side, you know, one of the things that um, I've you know, kind of realized over the last couple of years is that a lot of team members, especially team members that are like, no, we can't, why do we have deadlines? We can't, we're agile, we don't do dates, don't do dates, stop making me do dates. Actually kind of setting the context and the background of the business or the, re you know, the reason why some of the extra artifacts are useful Again, it's just, it can really just help people understand. You know, a lot of times people are pushing back, not because they're obstructive, they just don't understand why you're doing something different or why you'd want to. So, you know, a lot of times I will sit down with the team and I'll go through some of the challenges I raised earlier about like the event cycles of our industry. You know, I'll explain about the fact that, you know, we're managing a matrix in the portfolio of work. And once you kind of talk through some of that stuff, then people get more willing to give things a chance, right? So I think. With pushback, you know, across the board, a lot of it is people just, they don't have the full picture. So it's, you know, taking 30 minutes to talk through that can be really, really helpful. Sure. Yeah. 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 Uh, so this is, you've got some great tools, you've got a lot of unique uh, language around it. Yeah. How, what are your tips and tactics for onboarding new employees and managing the quality assurance of this process? Yeah. Around? That's a great question. So in terms of onboarding, um, so every member who joins our team, as well as kind of other onboarding sessions they go through, we go through our process with them. We go through the team structure, why it's structured that way. We go through all of this stuff. We go through the full project process, even if they're not going to work on projects, you know, even if they're going to be on our pods, you know, our kind of continuous delivery to begin with. So that again, they've just got the full picture and they, they have the expectation. In terms of process kind of oversight, that's actually part of my role. So, you know, we have a, we have like a framework essentially. So especially for our continuous delivery pods, you know, there are things that are non-negotiable. Like they have to be estimating using story points because that's part of how we do a lot of data analysis on our delivery across the team. You know, they, um, they have to be using some form of agile. You know, they need to be doing some sort of daily standup. If that's Scrum or Kanban, I don't really care. You know, but, and then they will also, you know, we welcome new ideas continuously. So, you know, especially new starters that join our team will say, spend three months, see like how things are going, and then come to me with questions or ideas. And some of it, there's a very strong reason why we do it a certain way. Other times I'm like, I don't know why we do that. Yeah, you're right. Like that's that we've just been doing that, and that doesn't make sense. Or you know, they've all got experience of doing something slightly differently, and we'll give it a go. So basically, we have like a framework, and there are, it's quite clear in there like what are things that the team can figure out themselves. Like how they do sprint, you know, sprint retros is up to them. The format they use. Um, there's things like the scrum times, completely up to them, all that kind of stuff. And then if there are bigger you know, questions or ideas that people have, then they'll bring it to me and we'll talk through. And if it's a great idea, I'll suggest we roll it out everywhere. You know, or we try with one team and then if they're successful, then we'll encourage others to do the same. So. We have time for one more question. Does anyone have anything? Okay, so thank you, Ask. Uh, so the NICU will be available outside. If you have any more questions or throughout the event, <laughs> also, uh, if you guys enjoy the food, make sure you thank Andre, who's standing right back there. He has done all the food. He, there are snacks out there, so please help yourselves. Next session starts in about 15. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you.